Let's check in on Theresa May. As some panelists wrongly predicted last week on this set, she is still the UK Prime Minister. In fact, you could say it's a bolstered Conservative leader who's making the rounds in Brussels after hard Brexiters in her own camp clearly failed in their bid to oust May over the draft Brexit agreement that's due to be rubber stamped by Brussels at a special summit this coming Sunday. Now, we're going to be asking how far this plan will get May when she tries to sell the deal to her own parliament in the coming weeks. And we'll test the strength of the EU bloc's unity. Last-minute objections have been raised over fishing rights, the future of Gibraltar, and more. It's ironic that the disputes involve France and Spain, home to the UK's largest expat communities on the continent. Just what will Brexit mean for ordinary folks on both sides of the channel? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Theresa May and the rocky road to uh, Brexit. We'll be joined from Brussels by Richard Corbett, leader of the UK Labour Party in the European Parliament. With us, Christian Leken, professor at uh, Sciences Po, the French uh, Political Science Institute, and CERI, its research wing. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, France 24 reporter uh, Claire Pacalin, who's been uh, looking at Brexit from both sides of the channel. How are I you? I have. I'm good, thank you. The uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and also in the channel. We'll talk about that yes, later on. Yes, we will. <laughs> the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Last week's unveiling of the draft Brexit agreement triggered a slew of cabinet resignations, a leadership challenge. You'll remember that three hours of grilling in Parliament. Now the challenge has fizzled, at least for now, the Prime Minister returning to Westminster for Prime Minister's question time with the winds in her sail, it seems. In relation to the vote that will come before this House on a meaningful vote on a deal from the European Union is very, is very simple. If you look at the alternative to having that deal with the European Union, it will either be more uncertainty, more division, or it could risk no Brexit at all. Are you surprised, Christian Lequen? Because, I mean, some people were writing her political obituary a week ago. There she was, and uh, yeah, it was a stormy session in, in yeah. the Commons, but uh, she's soldiering on. Well, I, 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 I don't think I'm going uh, to be so extreme and uh, I don't want to underestimate Mrs. May because uh, if you look at what she did uh, since the beginning, it was, uh, well, it was an impossible task, right, uh, trying to, to, to manage this uh, Brexit process due to the big split inside the Conservative Party. And uh, step after step, well, she tried to get and to obtain compromises. So um, now the big question is, is she going to uh, succeed at the end? Uh, but there is still a possibility that uh, she gets a majority uh, at, the, at the House of, uh, of Commons. So um, There's still a possibility. After, uh, after the events of the past week, you're increasingly feeling like uh, there, she could well, get the votes. Nobody could say what will happen. Uh, uh, there is a possibility. Of course, I'm not sure uh, uh, this possibility will uh, will happen. Maybe she will have to go back to the parliament a second time. Uh, it will depend a lot also of the political declaration that will be uh, uh, negotiated with the with the 27. But I I I don't think it's the it's it's the end of the May strategy, right? Uh, let's wait a bit, and 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 again, nobody could say anything about the uh, final result at the House of Commons. All right, it's uh, no one can say yet what's going to happen in the House of Commons. Uh, Tory backbenchers claim that. Uh, all right, they're giving up for now. They say they're still working on getting those votes for a leadership challenge. It just won't be imminent. And besides, there are other deadlines that await. What I think looks very likely is that when we get to the meaningful vote, there will be a very uh, large Conservative vote against. And perhaps of greater concern to Her Majesty's Government is uh, the position of the DUP. Because without the DUP, there is no majority. And we saw last night that they abstained on the finance bill. And that raises very difficult questions for the government. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all happening uh, over in the UK, Claire Pekanan, because uh, there's uh, this, uh, the, 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 these votes where the DUP, which has 10 seats 
in the UK Parliament abstained earlier in the week. They have their party conference coming up this weekend. Mm. Already Boris Johnson says he's going to attend. The government is sending Philip Hammond, who's a close ally of Theresa May. He's also going to be going to that DUP conference. Can she soldier on uh, without the DUP? I think it's interesting what you said about let's not underestimate her. Um, but another thing she does really have to worry about is that there are 13 conservative Scottish MPs who are very interested in what she's going to do when it comes to fishing. I know we're going to get to that a bit later in the programme, but there are the DUP MPs. But what about those Scottish conservatives? They want to see more from her. They want more guarantees. A huge part of the British fishing industry is in Scotland. And so really for those politicians up there, it's about fishing and they want to make sure that their constituents get what they want. All right. Joining us from Brussels, Richard Corbett, leader of the UK uh, Labour Party in the European Parliament. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. Thank you. So uh, first off, I'll, I'll ask you as well, when you think back to all the turmoil that's happened uh, since she became Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister. Would you agree that we've all perhaps underestimated Theresa May? She's still in the job. She's still in the job, but she's survived by kicking the can down the road, postponing decisions or not being able to get consensus in her party in the interminable Brexit negotiations, which have been negotiations within her own party, much more than with the European Union. And she's still kicking the can down the road because we're heading for a, a very vague future framework statement uh, which amounts to what we call a blindfold Brexit, leaving without any of the key issues being settled. But that was always going to be the case, wasn't it? You were going to have, on the one hand, the divorce deal, which uh, the terms of separation, and on the other hand, afterwards, uh, what the future trading arrangement will be. Uh, yes, but you say afterward, the, fi the final future framework treaty will be afterwards but with the divorce deal is supposed to be a statement a declaration a political declaration agreed by both sides with some detail about what that future framework is supposed to be indeed article 50 of the treaty requires it because it says a withdrawal agreement taking account of the future framework how can you take account of it if you don't have some measure of agreement as to what it's going to be but at the moment, we just have a to-do list, a list of things to be done, to be negotiated, to be sorted out after Britain's left, when it's no longer a member state, negotiating from a far weaker position. And we're expecting the British Parliament to endorse that, to vote to confirm Brexit with no clarity as to the destination. So what's going to happen? You, you heard, we heard at the beginning of the show Christian again saying, uh, you might have a first vote, a rejection, and then, uh, and then perhaps afterwards, uh, once markets have panicked, a second vote. Well, I think there will indeed be a rejection, but it's, it, uh, if Theresa May then just comes back and says, uh, keep uh, vote again until I get what I want, I don't think that will be very successful. Look, if... The majority in the British Parliament do not want to leave without a deal because we've learned a lot now about what a catastrophic scenario that is. So if you don't want to leave without a deal, but you've rejected the actual deal on the table, frankly, there are only two possibilities remaining logically. Either you negotiate a new deal, if that's possible, that looks, looks as though the, Theresa May won't want to do that. And the other possibility is to reconsider Brexit entirely, which is why there is growing support for putting this back to the people in another referendum. Um, opinion polls, at least, show a majority of people would now vote to remain and also show a majority of people want a referendum, a final say on the actual deal itself. So in this volatile political situation, anything is still possible. Claire, what are the chances of a second referendum? We are hearing more and more noise about a people's vote. We had a huge demonstration in London not too long ago. Absolutely massive. The whole of central London was totally blocked with demonstrators calling for a people's vote. Obviously, we know that the, the Labour Party would absolutely love another general election. They would love to get Jeremy Corbyn into power. So 
anything's possible in all of this. Um, anything is possible. It's very hard to look into the future as if we've got a kind of crystal ball. All right, you mentioned uh, Jeremy Corbyn. The Labour leader wants a general election, as you say, or a second referendum. But Corbyn also seems to be offering the government daylight by refusing to collude in the chaos that would be a no-deal scenario. The government is trying to force through this bad deal by threatening us all with chaos and serious damage to our economy of a no-deal outcome. But I believe the Prime Minister knows that no deal isn't a real option. Neither the Cabinet nor Parliament would endorse such an extreme and, frankly, dangerous course. Labour will not countenance a no-deal Brexit. Labour will not countenance a, a no-deal Brexit, a countenance, well, it's another way of saying, will not agree to a no-deal scenario. Richard Corbett, what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, worse comes to worse, Labour uh, will, uh, that, that's their red line, they won't allow a no-deal scenario. In other words, will they back Theresa May if uh, we came to a scenario where she's still refusing um, a second referendum, where she's still refusing a general election? that Labour and indeed a majority in the House of Commons do not want Britain to leave without a deal. And we're not going to let Theresa May blackmail us by saying, accept my bad deal, my botched Brexit, otherwise it's the disaster of leaving without a deal. We reject that binary choice. So if the deal is rejected, Labour would, would say, trying, well, we think there should be a general election and have a better a government for a start, but failing that, we'd say negotiate something different. But if that's not possible, of course, you have to come back to the possibility of Britain changing its mind about Brexit. Hence the idea of a people's vote, a referendum to reconsider this issue. How do you read, Christian Lequen, the words of uh, Jeremy Corbyn when he talks about uh, Labour will not countenance a no-deal Brexit? Well, that means uh, uh, that uh, he uh, will probably not uh, accept that Britain is going to leave without having negotiated something with the, uh, with the European uh, Union. But uh, it means also that he's opposing what Richard Corbett uh, uh, um, called a, a kind of blackmail coming from, uh, from the Prime Minister, right? Because the Prime Minister said, well, if you don't agree with my uh, uh, compromise, with my statement, then it will be a, a no deal. And this is something which is probably not uh, acceptable for Mr. Corbyn. But um, I'm not sure that Mr. Corbyn uh, um, is on a position where he would like uh, to uh, change totally the process and remain uh, himself. He, he is more interested in general election than in, uh, uh, well, uh, having a new referendum. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's the, it's the position of most of the members of the Labour Party, but Corbyn himself, you... Corbyn himself, what is interesting in, is, uh, well, getting the power, but probably not uh, uh, changing the process of Brexit. Uh, Richard Corbett, does that make you uncomfortable, the fact that uh, the leader of your party uh, only very reluctantly, it seemed, uh, agreed at the last party conference uh, uh, to the platform that you have spelled out? Well, the party conference adopted this resolution overwhelmingly, which uh, both says what I was saying earlier, that if the deal is rejected um, and if we don't get a general election, then we move on to the possibility of a referendum on the deal. But it also said in that same resolution to the government, if you think your deal is so good, why don't you put it to a referendum and see if people really do endorse it. And I think that's legitimate. Yes, we had a referendum two years ago. The people voted to leave the European Union. But every sign shows now, opinion polls certainly show, that the will of the people may well have changed. And to proceed with Brexit without checking that people still support that, especially as it's 
turning out to be very different from what was promised by the Leave campaign. Remember, the Leave campaign said it would be easy. It's turning out to be difficult. They said it would save lots of money, which would all go to the National Health Service. It's turning out to be a very costly exercise. They said there'd be wonderful new trade deals ready for Britain on day one with the rest of the world to replace lost trade with Europe. That's looking very dodgy. So it's understandable that Leave voters are saying, this is not what I voted for. For. This is not what was promised, and that's why public opinion is swinging in Britain against Brexit. Swinging against Brexit, we've seen how uh, markets haven't really panicked. We saw the uh, we we saw the uh, um, we saw the pounds drop slightly uh, after the announcements, but otherwise keeping calm. There's the feeling in Brussels, perhaps, that a deal is in hand. Of course, all that depends on uh, whether or not. Uh, they can for get past the hurdle of next Sunday when we come back in the France 24 debate. We're going to be uh, taking a look at uh, whether the EU has all its ducks in order. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, we're speaking as we head into the home stretch towards that uh, Sunday EU summit to approve a draft uh, Brexit divorce deal with the United Kingdom. Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister, in Brussels this Wednesday uh, with us to talk about it uh, from uh, the uh, European capital. Richard Corbett, member of the European Parliament, head of the uh, UK uh, Labour Party's uh, uh, de delegation in the European Parliament. Welcome back. Welcome back as well. Uh, to Christian Lequen, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, and uh, France 24's uh, Claire Pacalin. Claire, uh, on this, we've talked about the divisions in Britain. Let's talk a little bit about the divisions here on the continent. Now, we've seen some 11th hour demands by some EU members. It started earlier in the week with one topic, the French and the Dutch raising objections over fishing rights uh, post-divorce. Tell us more. Well, I was working on the, the fishing story from the very start of this year, and I was expecting this to happen. I was very much aware that this was going to happen because France and the Holland, they are very, very dependent on British waters when it comes to fishing. What's interesting to note is that the waters around the British Isles have a lot of fish and they have a lot of different species of fish. And they have been shared um, by European fishermen for centuries now. The Dutch and the French are very dependent on those waters. I was filming with some French fishermen in the channel um, and over 50% of what they fish, they fish in British waters. Um, the skipper who I was with said that he bought, he invested in his two million euro boat just before the Brexit vote and he was absolutely shocked and shaken to the core when he saw the result of the Brexit referendum because he relies heavily on fishing in British waters. Now, that said, British fishing as an industry only makes up 0.5 percent of Britain's economy. So yeah, it's it seems tiny. To, it seems to have always been this economic dwarf and this political giant in this exactly. discussion. Why is exactly. that? Exactly. Well, Britain is an island. People are very fond of the coastline. There's a certain amount of folklore around fishing. Certainly the industry has declined massively in the last 30, 40 years, but British people are holding on to it. You've got to think of those fishing villages where British people went on holiday and had scones and ice creams, and it's part of a lot of people's childhood. Um, that said, um, British fishermen rely massively on the European market. I mean, you will be very hard-pressed to find a British fisherman who didn't vote Brexit. They voted overwhelmingly for Brexit because they want more control over who can fish in British waters because they know there are a lot of fish in their waters and they're highly prized by, by other Europeans. Um, but the problem is the British public tend to eat only cod, fish and chips, salmon, often imported, and tuna. In a can, in a tin, which is also often imported. And that means British fishermen, they actually export more than two thirds of their catch, and most of it goes to the EU. So I was filming in Devon earlier this year um, in a lovely little town called Appledore, and, and I met a few people there who explained the, the problem, problem to me. You can take a listen to that now. Mm. 
shellfish caught a few hours ago off the coast of Devon. But much of it will end up on dinner plates in France and Italy. If you ask any English person what they want, you know, oh, can you get me a bit of fish? What sort of fish do you want? Cod. They ain't got a clue of eating anything else. That's the only thing they've eaten in, in the fish and chip shop, see? Battered cod and deep fried potato. Fish and chips is a British classic. Unfortunately, the British don't eat most of the various types of fish their fishermen catch. So over two thirds are exported to other EU countries. If, after Brexit, Britain stops European boats fishing freely in its waters, Brussels could put trade tariffs on British caught fish and push British fishermen out of the market. Richard Corbett, what's wrong with mussels and crab? Well, they're very important, and most of what Britain catches is exported to the European Union. Now, uh, the previous speaker said that most British fishers voted for Brexit. That's true. I did a, a debate in Grimsby, a major fishing center in Britain, um, and the, in the town hall a few months ago. Interesting division, whereas mo most of the fishers still support Brexit, those who work on land on fish processing are all very, very worried about it because they know that the fish that's processed and sold on to the rest of Europe is now under, th their livelihoods are, are now under threat because of Brexit. So who's got the upper hand, Claire Williams, uh, Claire Pacala, in this, in, this, in this negotiation? Is it, is it the uh, EU or is it Britain? Well, when it comes to having the upper hand, um, let's just take a look at what the British want when it comes to the British fishermen want. Their big issue and what irks them is the distribution of quota. Now, the European Union sets fishing allocation allowances for every nation every year. Um, that's known as quota in the industry. And British fishermen feel that they were unfairly given an unfair allocation of quotas. They feel that French and Dutch and Spanish and Belgians, they fish too much in British waters and they feel that they got a rough, a rough deal, really, a raw deal when it comes to quota distribution. So they say that if they were given more quota um, to fish things like quad, cod, then they could actually fish more um, things that British fishermen eat. And so they say part of the problem here is not just that, OK, we're catching things. Yes, British consumers need to start eating more locally caught fish, et cetera, and get rid of the, you know, imported tuna and whatnot. But also, British fishermen say, well, our hands are tied. We don't have enough quota and we can't actually fish what we want to fish. That said, the European quotas are extremely important because they protect fish stocks and they mean they're sustainable. Um, I spoke to some fishermen in Ilfracombe in Devon as well as in Milford Haven in Wales, and they told me how the quota system for them is not working out. We certainly haven't got any issues with um, foreign fishermen or Belgians or French or Spanish. And, you know, they're the same as us. They're working class people and, and they're tr trying to support their families the same as us. It's the policy makers which need to put things right. So what I liked about that soundbite is that um, Scott Wharton was saying to me, look, um, fishermen, we saw with the scallop wars earlier this year, very nasty scenes, um, yeah. you know, in the channel. Off, and off the coast of Normandy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, British fishermen fishing in Walla French waters. That got pretty heated. And what Scott said to me is, look, we're all, we all know each other, the British and the French and the Spanish, and the, we all know each other as fishermen. We speak to each other on the radio. Let's see. We talk to each other on Facebook. We sometimes see each other in ports around the continent. We know each other and we... We're in the same boat, so to speak. We're all trying to feed our families. We're all trying to make a living. But they're unhappy with the policymakers in, within their own governments, respectively, but also in Brussels. All right, and again, it's the question of who's got the uh, stronger hand when it comes to the negotiation you know, over fishing. At this point, I'd like to say hello to Patrick Sullivan. London traffic could not uh, keep him away. He's the CEO of Conservative <laughs> Political Consultants, Parliament Street. Thanks for joining us in the France 24 debate. Uh, when Thanks you look at this, the, this fishing question and the French and the Dutch raising hackles, others have followed suit, by the way, since at the 11th hour. Um, your thoughts, who does have the, the upper hand in the bargaining uh, over fishing rights post-Brexit? 
Well, I mean, uh, I think uh, Mrs May has had a pretty good week. I mean, uh, all things considered, I mean, uh, this time last week we thought uh, she probably wouldn't be Prime Minister, but uh, no, yet yeah, here she is. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg got too angry and uh, with the, uh, the the deal as was and rushed out to the cameras and said he was going to launch a coup and all that, and it didn't happen. Uh, he didn't get his 48 letters. So Mrs May is now, you know, uh, gone to uh, Brussels, you know, with a pretty strong hand, and uh, uh, you know, her party was beginning to sort of coalesce uh, around her. Uh, but what this, uh, the, these sort of new eleventh hour things have done is it is uh, giving the uh, your sort of European uh, reform group more time to plan, more time to you know, uh, try and uh, destroy Mrs May's premiership with uh, you know uh, a thousand different paper cuts. Uh, and that's why um, uh, Ms. Uh, Frau Merkel is so, so keen uh, for the 27 nations to ratify the deal this weekend. Right, so, uh, so we're not there. Uh, we're, well, we're not there yet when it comes to when it comes to that issue. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Christian Lequen, your thoughts again. On the final word on this fishing issue: Who who does have the stronger bargaining position, the the British or the Europeans? Well, um, I think in general the Europeans will have the, the, the strongest uh, position on every issue, and this is something Including that, uh, <laughs> of course, and even though the fish are in British waters, this is something the the British negotiators discover uh, during the negotiations. Why, right? in, the, well, in the case of fishing, why? Well, in the case of fishing, it's because it's the access of the market which is important. As it uh, was said by uh, Richard Corbett, the problem is not so much the question of catches. The problem is uh, uh, how to sell your transform uh, stuff in the European Union, and uh, if you take most of the of the fish and uh, uh, of the. Uh, um, uh, um, crabs. Uh, I'm, I'm, I forgot the the, the name. Mussels, uh, lobsters. Yes, but there is a there is a there is a name for that. Uh, Shellfish, whole, uh, crustaceans. Shell. Exactly, uh, <laughs> which are which are fished in the in the United Kingdom. Uh, they are they they are sold uh, mostly in France and in Spain. Right? You have uh, you have a lot of uh, commercial the French and the networks. Spanish and the Italians. Exactly. They like their, f their So that's fish. that's the issue. That's the issue. And and it's 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 typical. From, from the fishermen not to see too much the issue of, 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 of uh, uh, market. They, they really concentrate, you know, on the question of catches, the question of uh, uh, fishing rights. And, and um, I suspect this is, not, this is not the main issue in this negotiation. All right. While the French and the Dutch want a better deal on fishing rights, Spain's prime minister wants an entirely separate deal over the issue of the disputed UK-held territory of Gibraltar. It has to be something defined, negotiated and agreed by the United Kingdom and Spain. Today I regret to say that a pro-European government like Spain's would vote, if there are no changes, no to Brexit. Now, uh, Patrick Sullivan alluding to the fact that uh, uh, Angela Merkel has uh, weighed in this uh, Wednesday to try to convince the Spanish to... Uh, uh, paper over uh, some of the uh, uh, rough edges when it comes to the Gibraltar question uh, ahead of uh, uh, Sunday. Uh, Richard Corbett, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, uh, a, a no deal Brexit would be bad for the EU as, uh, as well as it would be bad for Britain. So uh, I think um, that's what the, you know, this is the best deal that the EU could get through the British Parliament, and you know if it does you know, pass, it will pass by you know, a handful of votes. Uh, this last-minute sort of you know negotiation thing is applying for stuff that would never pass the British Parliament. So uh, um, it, it basically plays into the hands of the uh, the hard Brexiteers who uh, want a clean Brexit and uh, don't want any sort of... Uh... Thank you, Patrick Sullivan. Let me ask Richard Corbett. Richard Corbett, your thoughts on what's going to happen next when it comes to Spain? Well, this has come up to people's surprise at the last minute because we thought that issue was settled. But, of course, 
you put yourself in this vulnerable position, don't you, if you walk out of the European Union and you have to negotiate with the European Union. It's not just the collective view of the other 27 member states. Any individual country is able to have leverage on all kinds of issues, in this case, Spain and Gibraltar. I'm not sure how far the other 27 will back Spain on this, especially if the Spanish demands uh, go too far. We will see over the next few days. Spain's foreign minister throwing oil on the fire, you might say, with a comment that the pro-Brexit uh, Daily Telegraph newspaper seized upon quickly, putting it on its front page. Josep Borrell, more worried about the future of the United Kingdom than of Spain, he said, adding he would not oppose an independent Scotland joining the EU as long as it had the consent of uh, London. It's qu quite a statement uh, since the Spanish uh, have been vehement against uh, Scottish independence uh, up to now because of Catalonia uh, th themselves. Uh, R Richard Corbett, your, your thoughts, how far is Spain going to go with this? Well, this, uh, there are a number of steps to go through before e that situation would ever even arise. First, Brexit would actually have to happen and go ahead. Then Scotland would have to decide that it wishes to leave the United Kingdom. Easier said than done. There's a number of steps to go through for that. Then Scotland would need to apply to join the EU, have an accession treaty agreed by everybody. Now, I assume the, that he is, Mr. Borrell is now saying that Spain would not have an, any objection of principle to that happening if an independent Scotland were to apply to join the EU. But this is really a rather hypothetical debate because there's so many, uh, that, that's so far ahead and with many scenarios in between, it's rather speculative at the moment. Uh, Christian, again, uh, at this point in time, uh, how do you see next Sunday playing out? Is it all going to be papered over? Well, I think uh, we are going probably uh, on the side of the 27 to uh, make uh, all efforts as possible to get uh, to get a, a, a final deal with uh, with the UK. So I, I very much agree that uh, now at this stage of uh, uh, the negotiation, of course, it's normal that uh, uh, single member states are coming with uh, uh, specific demands like uh, fishing, uh, etc. But on Sunday, probably, probably the uh, collective decision will be not to back too much this uh, specific demands and try to have uh, uh, an agreement. So for me, the, the, the most difficult issue uh, will not be in, uh, in, in Brussels, it will be afterwards in London. This is, the, uh, this is the tricky question. Yeah, and after the week that's been, Patrick Sullivan, what uh, will be the scenario that seems the most likely to you? Uh, the most likely uh, is actually not the scenario that I want. Uh, I think that uh, in, in all the time that the Brexit campaign, uh, the sort of Brexiteers have been arguing amongst themselves, sort of underneath the surface you've had people like Alistair Campbell, who brought the Labour Party back from the dead, and George Osborne, who brought the Tory Party back from the dead, working together to uh, lobby for a people's vote. And uh, Mr. Osborne is a very big fan of uh, the Robert Caro biographies of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and the thing about Lyndon Johnson when he was Senate Majority Leader was that he said the most important skill for a politician is how to count. Now, if Jeremy Corbyn swings the Labour Party behind a people's vote and enough Tory uh, sort of Remainers decide to, to vote for it, there will be enough votes in Parliament to, to push it. Um, Nicky Morgan, who used to be Education Secretary under David Cameron, uh, said she doesn't currently believe in a people's vote, but uh, if uh, the uh, ERG um, managed to uh, sort of uh, wreck uh, Mrs May's deal and uh, prevent it getting through Parliament, uh, she might well uh, decide to, you know, send the issue back to the British people. Uh, so these guys have been very organised. They've been planning a campaign uh, for the last sort of year at least, uh, whilst the 
um, my side of the argument, uh, have been fighting amongst ourselves. So we aren't prepared for that sort of scenario. Um, and you look at, in terms of presentation, how much better um, they have been. Uh, you had that uh, image-wise awful uh, press conference uh, that Jacob Rees-Mogg did yesterday. You know, uh, a bunch of sort of, you know, old white men in suits looking not very modern Britain at all, uh, compared to the People's Vote guys uh, last week having uh, Gary Lineker, a very popular uh, England, uh, former England footballer and uh, uh, sports commentator, uh, interviewing Joe Johnson, uh, Boris's uh, more Euro-friendly <laughs> uh, younger brother who uh, resigned from Parliament and wants that people's vote. So that's, uh, that's, the increasing, that's looking like an increasing scenario. Very briefly, because we're almost absolutely. out of time, uh, Richard Corbett, uh, w your reaction, what you're hearing from Patrick Sullivan. Do you think that there's going to be a second referendum, really? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm delighted to hear that from somebody who supports Brexit, who is almost admitting defeat, that it, it's quite likely now that the deal will not get through. That will eventually lead to another referendum, uh, people's votes to consider whether to proceed or not, and the people may well decide no. Brexit is bad for Britain. It's not what was promised. It's very different. We're better off remaining in the European Union. And by the way, we've learned a lot more in between about what Brexit means and about what the European Union means. We would rather remain. All right. And we'll, of course, see, because first we have to get past Sunday and that EU summit. I want to thank you, Richard Corbett. I want to thank uh, uh, Patrick Sullivan for being with us uh, from London, uh, Christian de Lequen and uh, Claire Pacalin. Stay with us, please. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Sanam Chantier, and who's telling me that, that the tech gods are not with you this time? Sadly uh... not. We're not connected, Francois. Oh, no. So I can talk you through some of this, if we may. All right. Well, t talk, 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 talk. I guess so, so we've been taking a look at the reactions on social media to Brexit and, of course, uh, looming Brexit and the impact it's having on Theresa May. And the ones that stand out are the most fiery reactions that we've had to the... Uh, work and pension secretary, the former campaigner for Remain, Amber Rudd, who came out and actually admitted that it's possible that a second referendum may be on the table. Which we just that's heard from pro Brexit exactly, Patrick Sullivan. Exactly, that's what you've been talking about. Uh, that's if Parliament rejects Theresa May's uh, deal. In fact, her controversial comment, and this doesn't come as a surprise, was seized upon by those who are pro a second referendum. Is, this a, is this a tactic to consolidate support it, around Theresa May? They've been saying that her weaknesses are strengths. Quite possibly. That's why we heard from people that actually support the idea of a second referendum. One of them was the former uh, Cabinet Minister Justine Greening, who said the public have the right to come out and take another vote to make their own decision. Uh, she told Channel 4 News, Parliament can't ignore the fact that there is, in fact, gridlock here. And we had another tweet to that effect. I wish I could show it. It comes from the Labour shadow Brexit Secretary, K. Uh, Starmer, who said that Amber Rudd is right here. In fact, Parliament will stop a no deal. And he said, I hope the rest of the Cabinet is listening, because this could lead to a catastrophe. Now, as we often do with subjects like this that are very divisive and polarising, we heard from others on Twitter. One of them was a very well-known uh, English lawyer and writer, that's uh, David Allen Green, who wrote an extensive thread of tweets saying that mm. actually there is no alternative path. It's either the no deal Brexit or, in fact, the deal that we have on the table. He said, look, Article 50 period is unlikely to be extended. We have both the government and the opposition here uh, saying that they're against the second referendum. And, of course, the EU is rather content with the current draft and they won't budge easily. Uh, now, what's quite amusing here is, uh, as I said, it's, this is quite polarising, it's a divisive subject, but we had one political commentator, Owen Jones, who has a massive following in the UK, I'm sure Claire's familiar with him, came out on Twitter and said, actually, we should be paying tribute to Theresa May. She's united people over Brexit against her worst of all worlds Brexit deal.
All right, but before we go, uh, Claire, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> because uh, a lot of the people watching us are British people who live abroad. You're one of them. And, I uh, am. Uh, uh, as a UK citizen living abroad, there's a lot of anxiety. What's your personal status right now? So I don't have French nationality. Um, I am British citizen living in the European Union. When I moved here nine years ago, when I was a 22-year-old, of course, I never imagined that I would find myself in this situation right now where I am applying for French nationality. If I don't get it in time before March, I will get what's called a carte de séjour, which is basically a residency permit. I hope I'll get one for the next 10 years, but it's not, it's not guaranteed. It's all a bit up in the air. And I've got to tell you, the paperwork that I have to do, it's like a full-time job at the moment. And another thing you have to know that is that in France, for some reason, paper expires. So everything, every single piece of paperwork you get, whether oh, that's yes. your birth certificate <laughs> or your, your criminal record, it has, to be either that, it has to be three months old or, or less. And so if you get a bit behind with your paperwork, then you have to reorder everything. Otherwise, half of your dossier yeah. is out of scratch. date. Mm -hmm. So wish me luck, guys. Me too. <laughs> Sanam's in the same boat. Christian, yes, a sympathetic the, word, and we'll leave it on that. Go yes, on. but the, the, despite all this administrative uh, difficulties, uh, uh, I think there is a huge number of British citizens living in France now who are applying for uh, a French uh, I have citizenship. an anecdote, anecdote yeah. for you. British people living in Britain who are applying for French nationality. So I know someone who's married yeah. to a French woman. Exactly. He um, was very excited. He got his French nationality, but he was very disappointed because the French consular in London has actually stopped doing the nationality ceremonies because they're overwhelmed. Yes, there were too many people. Too many people. That's right. So the right. ceremony That's when right. you get your nationality, they can't do it anymore because well, there are too many people. He can sing the Marseillaise when England play France <laughs> next February that, yeah. in the Six Nations. I want to thank our panel. Not sure he will. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.